It's a great blessing to be here with you today. You can tell that my accent is diasporic. I speak with southern accent because I am from southern part of the Philippines. Moved to South Korea for 18 years and then moved to southeastern part of the United States. So I have a pure southern, southern, southern accent. <laughs> I'm also a diaspora uh, person. When I was five and a half years old, I was away from home. My family has 10 brothers and 10 brothers, uh, six brothers and four sisters, and father and mother couldn't uh, feed them all at the same time, so I had to be uh, put in a different home. That was my first experience of being away from home. And then I grew up with seven different families. So you just imagine having seven different moms and, and dads. So I got tired uh, living with different families. I got married. And so that's it. It solved a lot of problems after that. Notice the title today. It's about diaspora missiology. I'm going to unpack that uh, in the next few minutes because it's kind of a big terminology for us. But I like what they put up here. Uh, by Laidlaw College, it's when the mission field comes to us. Not all of us will be able to go to every nation in the world, but God has brought the nations here. That's exactly what it means. So let's take a look at this picture. Where is this located? Dubai. Dubai. Good. What about this? Of course, it's the same picture, right? I mean, the same location, but different uh, uh, view. What about this? Good. And this? Dubai. Dubai. Now, who labor, labored hard to make all these buildings a reality? Who worked for all these buildings? The nations of the world, right? The nations of the world. Because in the history of, human be, uh, of humanity, human beings have always been moving from one place to another, from Adam and Eve's family to different parts of the world. Today, there are about one billion people moving from different parts of the world and all over the world. In other words, there every out of seven people in the world today, one is a migrant. Some would say out of five, one is a migrant. But realistically, there are seven billion people in the world and one billion of them move from one place to another, either from their homeland to another country or within their homeland from one state to another. One billion. 25% of them, of course, are already here in New Zealand. But when we talk about diaspora missiology, we're really talking about a missiological framework for understanding and participating in God's redemptive mission among people living outside their place of origin. You will find that I will be using diaspora as a terminology more today rather than migration. And I'm going to explain to you why it is so. So when we talk about diaspora missiology, we're talking about that interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary field. So it's a study of geographic or demographic mobility of people in various parts of the globe, of the globe viewed through the, uh, through the lens of God's redemptive plan for all nations, uh, the Pantata ethne. And specifically, it also refers to the exploration of how the body of Christ can participate in this redemptive purpose and work. Here's the thing that I discovered so many years ago when I was a missionary in South Korea. We need to have some kind of a biblical theology of global diaspora and understand it really from the perspective of God's purpose for this world. From a, with a very missional, missional thrust. And that, as you can see uh, in this, divine grace per, uh, permits the mobility of people around the world because God's grace goes wherever people go and operates wherever or wherever people are situated 
so that the divine missionary intent and redemptive purpose will be fulfilled by his, uh, will be fulfilled. By his grace, let's read it together, please. By his grace, God allows the scattering of peoples around the world, and God also gathers the nations through his grace and for his grace. You know, it's nice to, uh, to copy yourself, so you will really understand who you are, right? So I copied it from myself. <clears throat> but there's a question really about, is it really diaspora missiology or migration missiology? I have been asked, uh, that, uh, you know, many times uh, over all these years of being involved in diaspora mission. I have been involved in diaspora mission since 1985. I did not even know the word, the terminology. I, I, I just, you know, uh, reached out to international people and I didn't really understand what I was doing until such a time that diaspora, so-called diaspora missiology was born. But why is it that we prefer to use the terminology or nomenclature diaspora rather than migration. It is not really a matter of diaspora versus migration. It's really a matter of relationship. And as you can see in the board, broadly speaking, diaspora is, as I said already, global phenomenon of the dispersion or scattering of people in various parts of the world. But then migration facilitates this mobility of people. Did you notice that? So if you have an umbrella with you today, I'm not uh, expecting you to, to have rain after this, but if you had an umbrella, think about an umbrella wherein you have this, what? What do you see in an umbrella? You have spokes, right? And then you have what? A handle. And then you have a roof. Do we call it a roof covering? Probably. The spokes are the, mig uh, the, the, the mig uh, migration acts. And diaspora is the framework of those spokes. In other words, diaspora is the integrative framework for all these migratory uh, experiences of people around the world. And I know, I understand, especially if you are from UK, uh, migration missiology probably is stronger than diaspora missiology. But because I'm from the Philippines, I too would like to say, well, maybe it is diaspora rather than migration. And I'm going to unpack that more uh, today. So there is this creative tension between diaspora and uh, migration. But I would say this, and those of you who have read my introduction to global diaspora and mission, which was published by Regnum International in Oxford, you may have recognized this language. It says, diaspora refers to the overarching structure under which all forms of mobility take place. Migration serves as a tool to account for diasporic movements. So think of a wheel, for example. So there is a hub, right? You have uh, a wheel of a bicycle, by the way and you have all these spokes, and then there is a hub in the center of all these spokes that integrate all these spokes together. That's why the wheel can move. That's diaspora. The spokes are migration. Now, it's important for us to understand that because uh, sometimes in our practice, we may be uh, able to put them together, but uh, in many ways, uh, so many people are still confused about this. So let me move into uh, the heart of this uh, presentation. The global phenomenon of the dispersion of people from all walks of life presupposes the reality of divine human encounters in the face of demographic shifts caused by migration, natural calamities, wars and conflicts, cultural interactions, social and economic exchange, and clashes of worldviews and civilizations. In other words, in each movement or mobility of people, there's always grace that precedes it. Why? Because there is a purpose, as Acts chapter 17 would tell us and reminds us, that God has appointed movements of people and God has appointed residences of people. You know, I, I, I wish that I, I, uh, I would have been born in the US, for example, why? Because I really would like to be 
tall, and I was born in the Philippines. And uh, my mom would kept telling me when I was a young boy uh, during Easter, uh, and he said, listen to that bell from a Catholic church when it rings at 6 o'clock in the evening. Jump as high as you can so you will get taller. <laughs> and I did for so many years. And I, I overjumped. So, I, you know, I'm short. <laughs> Which is, of course, biblical. The Bible says everyone falls short of the glory of God. <laughs> so that's a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Hmm. Now, here's the question. Why is it that we speak so much about this concept of diaspora? Well, the Bible actually has three love commands in the Old Testament. Do you remember the, those three? What's the first? Love command in the Bible. The Shema, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then, what's the second? Love your neighbor as thyself. And the third? That's the third. The Old Testament does not teach loving your wife. Ouch. Right? <laughs> It's in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, the third love command has something to do with the aliens, with the foreigners. Look at that. In verse 20, uh, 33, it says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them, because the foreigner residing among you must be treated as your what? Native-born. Each time you look at a foreigner on the street, you're actually looking at what? The image of God. You're also looking at yourself as somebody who relates or someone who relates to this foreigner. The Bible says, love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. The Aspera missiology is not a modern invention. It has been part of the heartbeat of God. It has been part of the heartbeat of God. And as we take a look at this, you will find that many of these verses in the scripture really would lead us to the heartbeat for the for us. Beginning with Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, when God said to Adam, what did he say during creation? Go and multiply, multiply and then? In other words, God said, disperse. That's where we begin. That's where we begin. That dispersion has always been part of the missional structure of God's work in this world, or the redemptive structure of God's work in this world. Now, before this command, of course, the redemptive plan of God already started. I love asking this question to pastors during conferences. When did mission begin? And I got so many answers, responses. Uh, New Testament, Old Testament, creation. No, 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 no. Mission or Monsieur Day began before the foundations of the world. Ephesians chapter 1. That even before the foundations of the world, God has chosen us to be his people. The mission of God did not begin in the Old Testament. The mission of God began before this world was created. And notice what we have here. This is kind of a linear way of looking at how the diaspora should be reached with the gospel. And if you have time, you may want to take a look at some of those passages here. You, you, there's actually a faster way to do this. Just take a picture of that, go home, then read all those passages, right? It's free. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. For so many years, mission has always been from the west to the rest. From the west to the rest. And then we have this manifest destiny, of course. And, and the, the idea of trusteeship, the partnership in terms of colonialism and mission, working hand in hand. 
But in the Bible, in the Bible, mission is not about location. It is about access to the gospel. Whoever comes to you, whoever is near you, whoever is beside you, whoever is before you or behind you, you have to give access to that person, access to the gospel. And here's what we have here. You remember this passage? When Isaiah or God through Isaiah says, you are my witnesses, speaking to, of course, Israel, right? And then in the New Testament, Jesus also used the same word. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. And he says, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in, and in Samaria and un, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Did you notice something? Did you notice this word here? And did you check your NIV? It's not there. But in the Greek language, this word is there. That one word, that small word. Those of you who have studied Greek, you know that word, right? When you remove that word from your translation, something happens to your idea and understanding of Missio Day. If you delete that word from your app, something happens to the way you understand God's redemptive work in the world. If you put it back, here's what happens. And let me ask this question first. Did the early disciples forget the te in Acts 1.8? At least until Acts 8.1? What happened in Acts 8.1? What happened? Persecution struck, right? And then they scattered. And then they realized, ah, oh, this is exactly what Acts 1.8 is all about. It took them seven chapters. Can you imagine that to fulfill Acts 1.8? But what does it mean to really understand mission with both as the framework for understanding God's redemptive work? Well, it's like this. If you remove te or both from that passage, here's what happens. You will have a big Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and ends of the earth will become smaller. So I, 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 you know, I love to ask this question. If your Jerusalem ministry is big, like if you have this mega church in one place, does it follow that your vision for Judea and Samaria and ends of the earth get bigger too? And the answer, of course, is no. For every mega church that rises in this world, 25, 35 churches die. Are you with me? For every mega church that rises, 25, 35 local churches die because they are sucked into this mega church. And then the smaller communities would die. No wonder Dr. Tim Keller of Redeemer Church in New York decided to stand down as a pastor. How many of you are familiar with his ministry. His church planted 381 churches. Can you imagine that? And they were into multi-site or multi-site campus. Three. And then Tim Keller in July will be stepping down. Why? He would focus more on teaching pastors how to plant churches. Focus more on teaching pastors how to disciple new believers. And then the multi-site campuses will become autonomous and independent and so-called regular congregations. When you understand both in Acts 1-8, something happens. Something happens. Because that one word tells us of this. First, 
simultaneous missions engagements. So you do your Jerusalem ministry here. At the same time, you reach out to people in Judea and in Samaria and the ends of the earth. Now remember, mission is not about location. Remember that. And I'm going to unpack that more. And here's what happened too. When you put back both into Acts 1.8, here's, uh, here's the result. You'll be able to develop strategic missions partnerships. And the third, you'll be able to identify mission spheres. You'll be able to identify mission spheres. Now, it's important for us to understand that when we read Acts 1.8 deeply, you discover that our mission spheres are actually located in four areas. Did you know this? Your Jerusalem area? What do you have in mind if you, if you speak about Jerusalem? Missions within your family networks, right? And then Judea? Missions within your extended networks, relatives, right? So in the Philippines, when there is a baby dedication, we have godfathers and godmothers. You just imagine how blessed the kid is during Christmas. Yeah. Why? Because most family members would say, hey, let's have like 50 godmothers and 50 godfathers. And uh, they're actually thinking of Christmas. Yeah. That is also a sphere of your mission work. And then, did you notice Judea, I oh, know Samaria? Who were the Samaritans? Of course, they were the mixed uh, you know, uh, group of people, uh, biracial, so to speak. Uh, you have the Jews and then the Samaritans uh, intermarrying. And the result, of course, were Samaritans, right? I mean, the biracial co uh, community. In other words, if you take a look at Samaria, you will find that it's really a combination of Jerusalem and Judea in terms of degree of influence. Your networks in your Samaritan sphere actually are those people from within your family at the same time from your extended family members. That includes your friends and acquaintances. And then you move into the ends of the earth. Who are these people? The ends of the earth. How many of you have cell phones here? Please. I mean, please, uh, would you please uh, pull up your cell phones, please? Cell phones, cell phones, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Up in the air? Great. You are just holding the ends of the earth right there. You see? My team, some of them were just talking to their sisters or brothers, you know, back home or husband. In North Carolina, no. if they are hungry for a barbecue, they said, hey, can you prepare a barbecue for me right there? Did you notice how many people are there in your directory? I was teaching this kind of uh, you know, mission sphere one, uh, one day, and a deacon came to me and said, you know, I just realized that I'll be very busy in the next few days because there are 600 people in my directory. So you just imagine how busy I will be in terms of reaching out to them. The ends of the earth can be found right there. That's where the ends of the earth is. God has brought all these names and, and, and people and, and, and network of relationships closer to you. And if we are creative enough, we can change this world together, beginning with our cell phone. So here's uh, what we can uh, think about more. So when we're talking about missions engagement simultaneous, we're really talking about intentionality. I'm so aware that every day when I wake up in the morning, I'm so aware that, that my presence should not be wasted. If I rub shoulders with people, I know that I have to be a witness to, that, uh, to those people. That's intentionality. I'm also aware that my presence also has something to do with intercultural uh, missions. 
a while ago, Steve and I, uh, Steve is here, uh, CMS director of New Zealand. I, I was trying to tell him that, you remember in 1974, during the, fir uh, the first Luzon Congress, the big theme was what? The highest priority, you remember that? E3, many churches around the world move into cross-cultural missions, right? You remember that? And then, after the wars, many churches also move into multicultural missions. But if you look at Acts 1-8 carefully, you will find that it's about interculturality. Cross-cultural is one way. You cross culture, and then there's a tendency that you impose on that culture. Multicultural is hodgepodge. So you have a congregation under one roof, right? And then trying to put them together. And then you sing all these songs that some of them probably would hardly be able to understand. So instead of singing majesty, probably, you know, they were not so familiar with that language. So they would sing magic tree, <laughs> worship his magic tree. Uncle Jesus, you know, Jesus became an uncle, yeah, so. And, you know, like, so, some, of, some of them are not really good at English. And I, I remember when I was teaching uh, in Korea, I, I, I've taught in Korea for 10 years, and Ang to our PhD students right here. And so I remember we had a student from Indonesia, and he said, you know what, I was so disturbed one day because my... My worship leader started to encourage us to start worshiping, and he said, today we're going to sing this beautiful song, Refiner's Fire. You know that song? Uh, those of you who belong to my generation, of course, you, you know that song, yeah. And then there's, there's a line that says, I choose to be what? Holy. And this... You know, this guy from Thailand, he was not very sure about the word. And so he just kept singing and he said, I used to be holy. And you just imagine the whole congregation sang with him. <laughs> Multicultural missions means it's really a hodgepodge. And I, I remember I was talking to one of the uh, one of the leaders in Singapore a few years ago, and he said, I really would like our congregation to be multicultural. And so I asked him, I said, what is your biblical basis for that? And he said, Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. You know that passage, right? What does it say? That all the nations will gather around the throne of God, worshiping him. And then after that, I told him, pastor, that's in heaven, not earth. Are you with me? If you take a look at this passage carefully, you will find that intercultural missions has two parts. First, it has something to do with reciprocal relationships. You don't impose, you listen. You don't simply give, you take in too. So there is this symbiotic relationship. There is this uh, symbiotic uh, process going on. So I listen to you, I learn from you, you learn from me. Reciprocal relationship. It, the, the, the other part of that is transformational relationship. So when I learn from you, I'm changed. And so you are. You change too. That's the beauty of interculturality not just multicultural, wherein you put all these nations together, that will be the outcome, but not necessarily the goal. Our goal is to make disciples of all nations, and some of us would probably say amen, right? Because today, it has changed a lot. The Great Commission, or as I call it, the Central Commission, is to go into all the world and take Pictures of all people. <laughs> Selfie, yay, you know, all this. Uh, make disciples of all nations. Make them learners of Christ. That's our goal. That's our goal. And let's take a look at this. It's also about incarnational missions. 
In other words, people should be able to hear the gospel within their cultural form. The symbols that resonate with them will be very important to them. I, my wife and I just planted a church eight months ago, and I noticed that 80% of our people are from the Catholic church. And so we are meeting at a basketball, basketball stadium, and if you're a Catholic, you know what I'm saying. That's not a worship place, right? It's what? It's a sports, it's a sports arena. And so I told my wife, why don't, you, uh, why don't you buy a small table and then put flowers, you know, and candles every Sunday, every Sunday uh, I mean, uh, afternoon, so that when Catholics would come, they will somehow feel that this is a worship place. That's incarna uh, being incarnational. And we do that all the time. And my, my associate pastor is a, is a Chinese uh, leader. Um, and so, in fact, I, have, uh, you know, I told him that many of these are Catholics, so when we pray, don't pray long, because they will go to sleep. You know? <laughs> pray short and precise and concise. And he understood what I'm trying to say. Incarnational. So here's what we have here. You ask me, did Paul re really have a strong diaspora ministry? The answer is yes, so you'll be surprised. So let's take a look at this for a moment. He started with interfaith missions, missions among same ethno-linguistic cultures. Jerusalem was the base of that. And then he moved into interfaith missions, missions among shared but mixed cultures. And he did that during his second missionary journey. Then he moved into multi-faith missions, which is missions among diverse cultures, during his second, third, and fourth missionary journeys, the ends of the earth. There is a pattern. While it is not prescriptive, it is something that we can learn from. It is important for us to understand that the diaspora mission or ministry is not a modern invention. It is something that is always you know, part of who we are as people of God. It is something that is always part of what we are supposed to be and do as people of God. So when we speak of diaspora, the first thing that comes to our mind is a concept, right? But not just a sociological concept, it's really a biblical concept. God said, go, multiply. In other words, disperse and take care of creation. It's a biblical concept. It is also a category. It describes a lot of things that are taking place in this world. Under diaspora, we have refugees. We have women that, uh, who are trafficked. We have, you know, all forms of Slavery, children being sold by parents to different countries. And then we also have economic migrants. We have international students. So the word diaspora really is important because it describes something. It categorizes people so that we can develop appropriate strategies. It's also a framework, a biblical framework, for understanding what God really is trying to do in this world. And uh, as I said, when I started uh, Diaspora Missions back in 1985, I really did not understand what I was trying to do. So we had Nigerians, and then we have people from the US, and from, from Korea, of course, and then we have uh, Japanese. I remember my, my uh, I was pastoring a church when I was an MD uh, student, and my, associate pastor was from Japan. And so his name is June. And June loves to sing. So I appointed him as a music director. So he would stand uh, before people every Sunday morning and he would tell them to, shall we all lies? <laughs> okay, June, uh, no, no, not lies, June, rice. And then, you know, in those days, uh, there was this powerful song 
that uh, churches in the Philippines would love to sing. And they would say, Ar uh, alive, right? Alive, alive, alive. And June, Jap being Japanese, he, he, would, he doesn't care. He would say, okay, shall we all clap our hands and sing? Arrive, arrive, arrive. Very scatological. <laughs> Jesus arriving all the time. Uh, I didn't really understand why June was with us. I don't understand that. He's now president of a huge company in, uh, in Nagoya. Uh, but I don't understand why God has brought him to, to my life. But today, if you go to Nagoya, while he, June is very busy serving as president of his father's company, he inherited that company. They had more than 300 engineers when I visited the company in 1988. June also has organized Filipino congregations, teaching them the word of God. So you see, diaspora is a framework we're in. We can understand what is it that God wants us to be and do as people of God. It's also a practice, of course. It's a lifestyle. And then it's also a strategy to reach out to the nations, to reach out to the nations. It's also a metaphor. One of the things that I love about diaspora is diaspora is like a river or a lake. You have beautiful uh, uh, lakes here and beautiful uh, oceans, right, or beaches. And then what do you see on top of the river, the surface of the river? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see under that, underneath? Of course, you don't see unless you're Superman, right? <laughs> the aspirin is like that. We only see the surface. But there are so many things that are taking place under that. It's a metaphor for us to be imaginative as people of God. And I, since 1988, I've been part of theological education as a teacher. But I always pray to God, Lord, if I teach, the contract that I sign for teaching should always have something that say, I'm allowed to reach out to the nations. So when I was a pastor, uh, no, when, when I was teaching in Korea for 10 years, I was also a pastor. And Ang Tu, who was an international student there for his THM, was also a pastor, reaching out to, the, uh, to those from Myanmar. Because that is a commitment that we make. That is a lifestyle. In fact, there was a time when I was a, a professor in Korea, I pastored two churches for more than five years. One church was in the morning, Presbyterian church, and the afternoon church was Baptist. So you just imagine, I was Presbyterian in the morning, <laughs> and then I was Baptist in the afternoon. And then I would go back to towards Trinity Graduate University, I was just a Christian. If you understand and feel the heartbeat of God, you know what to do. You don't have to be told as to what you are supposed to do. Because God works in various ways, and he can, he can use you, of course. So here's how we integrate diaspora <laughs> ministries as well as diaspora missiology. We start with biblical theological frameworks, and this is exactly what I'm trying to do today. And then we move into historical context. We try to understand why these people move here. I, I, I invited uh, two of our brothers from Myanmar to really talk to our students today. Tell them, why is it that those from Myanmar came over to Oakland, for example? Why people move from one place to another? It's important for us to understand that. Are they economic migrants? Are they bridal war? Uh, are they war brides? Are they business people? Why are they here? So historical context can actually bring us or give us a perspective of God's work in a particular situation. And then we also need to learn socioeconomic, cultural, political factors and issues involved in diaspora. We were at Central Baptist Church in Sydney. And it was a wonderful experience to me. That church was, as they said, the oldest Baptist church in Australia. But if you go there, you'll find that it's mostly Chinese. 
So I got intrigued. I said, what happened? And then the senior pastor told us what happened. So here's the thing. The Chinese moved into Australia, and they started the Cantonese. It was first people from Hong Kong. And then people from the mainland moved, mostly students, during the Tiananmen Square event. So they opened the Mandarin worship service and fellowship. And I thought about it and said, wow, the political upheaval in one nation becomes a missional opportunity in another. This is when history becomes important for us. We need to understand why these people are moving so that our methodology would be appropriate for those who have moved into our neighborhood. And then our application, of course, our strategy. And then our practical and experiential approach to these people. I have a doctoral student who was actually, he, he was from Korea. He moved to Michigan, University of Michigan, for a PhD in social work. And he told me that for eight months, no American invited him to visit, you know, uh, American house. He was not a Christian at the time. Now, he said when he became a Christian, he told God that he will be a minister to international students so that they will always have a home when they come to the U.S. You can go to his website, The Faithful City is there. You can learn a lot from this uh, pastor, Pastor Yu. And right now he's, he's working uh, on a project with me on trauma, uh, especially among those who have difficulty transitioning from India, from China, from different parts of the world in Arizona. Arizona State University has more than 7,000 international students. That's his field right there. That's his field right there. So when we speak of diaspora missiology, here's what is really important to us. When we try to develop ministries, did you notice that? It's diaspora missions and then diaspora missiology. This one is about the practice and this is about the framework, okay? So we start with the church, the assembly. It's important that the church is involved in this and that the things that we do in relationship to evangelizing and ministering to those from different nations should always be part of the church mindset. And then the next is the academy, the theological institutions, the seminaries. It's important that we get engaged. And I had the privilege of offering the first PhD uh, course in diaspora missiology at Torch Street in 19, not in 19, but I'm not that old, uh, in 2007. That was one year after our first Lausanne diaspora consultation in Edmonton, Canada. I went back to Korea and I told my president, I'm going to do this. And after that, we have produced a good number of uh, those who work on PhD programs, doing research in diaspora uh, communities in Korea. Some of them really produced very good and powerful research uh, for so many of those ethnic people. That includes Indonesian, uh, Indonesian Iran. Mm. So the academy should be part of this, should be involved in this. They should develop curriculum. Right now, uh, where's the book? That book is being revised now because this is our main textbook for now. And we are developing a curriculum for this for schools worldwide. If you are interested in some of the things that I did in terms of curriculum development, let me know. I'll send it to you for free. And each time you click, it's $2 for diaspora missions. No, just kidding. <laughs> but the school should be involved in this because this is where, I mean, it is, I mean, the school is uh, the second center of theological education. The first center is the church. And the second center of theological education is a, ch uh, is a school. That's why the curriculum of the school should meet the needs of the, of the church and society, not simply offering courses that professors love, you know, 
uh, love to offer. I wish I can do that, but as a pastor myself, I know that each time I go back to my local church, the questions that they ask of me should be something that I should be able to respond to as a professor, not just as a pastor. And diaspora, missiology, and missions should deal with the agency, the missions, organizations. And I'm so happy that some of you are here representing your organizations. You should be involved in this. You should be involved in this. And John Baxter, who founded Next Move, uh, who, the, I mean, Next Move actually specializes research for diaspora uh, on behalf of the organizations in the world, missions organizations in the world. He will be willing to work with your organizations. He's working closely with the IMB uh, research team, trying to map, uh, map out those ethnic communities in your uh, neighborhood. He will be able to help you uh, with that. And diaspora, missiology, and missions should, always, uh, should also deal with the arena, the, the, gro the, the, the ground zero of uh, migration, the pains, the, the trauma, the crisis that these people go through would have to be dealt with. I was, um, during our lunch today, I, I shared with, uh, with, our, uh, with some of our friends from different, uh, I think maybe three or four organizations that in the US, the Bhutanese have the highest suicide rate among all the diasporas. Because many of them were born and grew up in a refugee camp. And then all they knew about US is Hollywood, you know, uh, Frozen and uh, what else, Mission Impossible. And, and then they moved to the US and they realized that there are so many realities there, they cannot even speak English. And so they're not able to work and get adjusted easily to the US culture and society because they, they cannot function. And so they just end their lives. This is when we have to deal with this. We have, we, have to, uh, we have to offer programs that would help them process their thoughts, their emotional issues, their mental health. That's important. It's not just about evangelism. It's also about helping them making, uh, being whole as a person. And then the Aspro Missiology and Mission should also address the Acropolis. We need to knock on the doors of our senators and our congressmen and our mayors and governors telling them that these people also deserve a good life in our country. And I'm, I'm sure that many of you are involved in this. So let's move on and look at this framework when we talk about diaspora missiology, we're really talking about three components. The first is mission to the diaspora. This is the Lausanne framework. Mission through the diaspora and mission beyond the diaspora. Because I'm a Filipino, I think differently too, right? And so I would say mission among the diaspora and mission with the diaspora and mission by the diaspora. So the first has something to do with ministering to people who move geographically or in transition to a new place of residence. The second has something to do with ministering from diaspora to their kinsmen in their homeland or elsewhere in partnership with other Christian communities, including diaspora congregations. And the third has something to do with ministering cross-culturally and interculturally to the host society and other ethnic groups within their geographic context. It's really amazing. I have seen a few churches in the, uh, in the US, for example, who actually are now hosting American congregations. Like there's a Korean church in Charlotte. And it's really interesting because they're now hosting one of the Desiring God churches. You remember John Piper's uh, movement? And so I, I went to the senior pastor and said, Moksanim, what happened? And then he started telling me you know, his story. And it's an amazing, powerful story about how a diaspora congregation like this Korean community, a Presbyterian community, can really host the host society and reach out to them. It's an amazing, amazing story. 
So when we talk about mission among the diasporas, we're really talking about diasporas being recipients of evangelism and discipleship training. Not just discipleship, but also discipleship training. So many of our churches today just stop with discipleship, but they lack discipleship training. And then when we talk about mission with the diasporas, we're really saying that these diasporas can be agents of evangelism and discipleship training. And when we talk about mission by the diasporas, we're, we're saying that these diasporas can be catalysts for evangelism and discipleship training. Amazing, amazing story. The International Student Ministry here in Auckland, as well as in New Zealand and other parts of the world, is one of those amazing stories where students became Christians while they were away from their homeland, and then they have become catalysts for world evangeliz uh, evangelization. Many of our denominations in the Philippines actually were started by international students in America. They went home to the Philippines, they started the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church. They were international students. Amazing story. They will become catalysts for evangelism and discipleship training. But there are patterns that we need to understand. And the first is that we also need to understand social class. It's not easy to reach out to people from different uh, places. It's not easy. Believe me, no matter how spirit-filled you are, <laughs> There will be challenges because social classes are different. And then the second pattern that we need to understand is communication pattern. I was just sharing with Steve a while ago that, you know, how good it is to put all these nations in one worship service, right? But you know what I'm saying. That even if you use translation, you know that some of those would really miss the meaning of the messages. And so while others would sing, Lord, I offer what? My life to you. Others will be singing, Lord, I offer my wife to you. <laughs> no. They rhyme, right? Life, wife, communication. When I was new in Korea, I was invited by a deacon. I, was, I, I first went to Korea as an international student. And so I was invited by a deacon. And then so he was so nice to me. And he said, uh, what do you think of Korea? You know, in Korea, there are three basic questions. Yeah. How old are you, of course? And then the second question is, are you married? You know? And then third is, what do you think of Korea, of course? Uh, but this third question was uh, different. He looked at me and I said, do you miss my wife? That's what he asked of me. I said, no, sir. I miss my wife, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, communication, uh, of course. What he had in mind was if I missed my wife, but he just did not have the language. And so and I was pastoring a church in Korea, and the deacon would always pray to start the worship service. And this was a cold winter Sunday morning. And he started praying and he said, oh, Lord, our God, this is a Korean deacon, you are a refugee. <laughs> you just imagine, I look around and I can see, you know, shoulders moving. And I said, actually, that's biblical. <laughs> Jesus was a refugee too, right? <laughs> because some of them, you know, um, in Korea, cabbage is cabbage, church is churchy, of course, MDV is MDV. And I understand that, of course, but what I'm trying to say here is this. It is important that we understand communication patterns for our ministry among these ethnic communities to be successful. And the third actually has something to do with the thought and thinking patterns. The thinking pattern, the worldview of people is so important. Worldview is so important. And I remember first time I went to Korea, I was invited by a Korean church to preach. This was in 1992. And I was just sitting, you know, the Muksanim, the ordained pastor was on this side and I was on this side and I was sitting like this and I was, you know, doing like this. And I realized the congregation were, was, uh, actually was looking at me with their sharp eyes. And I look at the pastor and the pastor was singing like this and, mm, 
So slowly, I put my leg down, and then put my hands, my lap. I learned fast. I learned fast. World view. World view. And in Korea, I couldn't teach with arms folded like this. It would be very disrespectful. World view. We also need to understand coping pattern of people. Counseling works in some cultures, in other cultures, no. Why? Because they're just too private. We also need to understand the economic pattern. This one is important, by the way. Do you know that I can have 10 Korean members and still have, like, I would say $4,000 offering a Sunday? And then I can have, like, a Filipino congregation with 100 and then the amount is the same. Like 100 with $4,000 and then 10 Koreans with uh, $4,000. What's the explanation? The Filipinos think of their families back home first. 80% of their money will go back home. Why? Because mother, father, brothers, sisters depend on them. So an economic pattern is so important. Those of you who are working with you know, uh, people from Myanmar, for example, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, you know what I'm trying uh, to say here. It's important for us. Don't judge them. Just be happy that you can trust the Lord more you know, in terms of giving. And so many of these American churches actually don't understand that. And in fact, some of, uh, some of these congregations actually folded uh, some of these Hispanic churches simply because they just couldn't sustain it anymore. But it's not about their lack of understanding. It's about what? Their lack of awareness of why is it that a Hispanic congregation would send 80% of their money back home. So it's, it's a matter of awareness. It's a matter of awareness. It's doable. And then leadership pattern, of course, especially among women. And if you're ordained in Korea, for example, how many of you are Koreans here? And I say, wow, good. So in, one time I asked my students, I said, can you write how many titles do you have on the board? And they wrote 17. So if you are a Muksani, a Muksa, for example, there are three levels. If you are a, like a Chandusa, okay, all kinds of levels, three levels, always Trinitarian you know, approach, and then you have like 17, 19 titles. Plus the fact that you bow, if you're Chinese, uh, Japanese, and Korean, you bow, right? And say, Anyaseyo. In the Philippines, we simply say what? When you greet a person in the Philippines, who are Filipinos here? One Filipino. In the Philippines, we simply do this. Hello. <laughs> That's it. Mm. Hi. And then, where's the bathroom? <laughs> Who cares, you know? Uh, are you okay? No? So don't judge them. Don't judge them. It's just that it's part really of who they are as people. And then employment, of course. Uh, many of them really transfer, I mean, move from one employment to another because they're trying, they're trying to, um, to be more gainfully employed. And that's a pattern in diaspora ministries. And so what are the key players and partners here? I'm, I'm, I'm moving into the end now. The first is local leadership and congregation. It's important that you leaders should really start with this and mobilize your people to really reach out to the nations. You start with a vision. Show them that this is really part of God's plan. And then returning Christian expats, very important. Then former overseas missionaries. I remember when there was this economic downturn in Korea in 2008, 2009, so many of these missionaries overseas had to come home. That was the time when the Korean church realized that the nations are in Korea. And those who came from the Philippines, from Russia, from different parts of the world, they started reaching out to the nations inside Korea. And then Christian diasporas, of course, and affiliate diaspora congregations. 
then Christian international students is so important. I don't have to overemphasize that because it's obvious. And then the diaspora Christians in the country and respective ethno-linguistic congregations, a good number of them are here. Educational institutions. When I was part of Torch Trinity, here's what happened. We had 150 international students in our school. Every single international student was involved in the diaspora ministry. Every single student. And you, you take a look at the history of diaspora missions in, 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 in Korea, and you realize that probably 70% of it actually were started by the international students. So powerful. And then, of course, we can partner with organizations and institutions, religious instit uh, institutions or organizations and NGOs and governmental uh, organizations. Um, and then you ask me, how can we do this? Well, there are so many ways to do this. But one way actually is tent making. One way is tent making. In tent making, you don't have to raise funds, right? So let me ask you this question. Can you guess? In what country are the churches working to mobilize one million tent makers who will serve in strategic parts of the world by 2020? What country? India. India? Korea? The Koreans, they now have, uh, you know, they, they encourage Christians to retire early and then have a second career and then serve as missionaries. That's what they do. Uh, but this is not Korea. China? This is not China. Of course, Philippines, thank you. <laughs> thank you. In 2010, we sent out 100,000 tent makers. In 2020, we're sending 1 million. We're almost there. I was teaching in the Middle East many years ago. I used to teach there. And I was told by one of my hosts that, I mean, of a beautiful story. An American professor who was a believer during a break <clears throat> was listening to a group of, I think there were five female students. And he was so intrigued by what they were singing or humming. They were humming a song that was so familiar to this professor. And the song was mm, 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 mm. They were just humming. They were not singing. They were not allowed to sing those words, right? And so he was so intrigued. And he approached them and said, who taught you that song? Do you know that song? And he said, our nannies. Who are these nannies? They're Filipinos. Do you know why there's so much oil? in that part of the world? Do you know? From a missional perspective? Mm -hmm. Do you know why there's so much oil deposit in, this, in that part of the world? Because if the Middle East is poor, the nations will not go there. But because the Middle East is rich, the nations gather there. And then this is what happened. By his grace, God allows the scattering of individuals and people groups around the world. God also gathers people in the move through his grace and for his purpose and for his grace. Let's read it together. Whenever people move, the gospel moves. Wherever people go, the gospel goes. Thank you very much, and I will take your questions. Thank you.